Welcome to Sound Bites for a Monday as we continue our study in the book of Revelation. And today, um, on the fifth day of the Thy Kingdom Come uh, initiative in prayer, we're looking at a great vision of heaven in Revelation chapter 5. Let me read it. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and to open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found to be worthy. No one could open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the centre of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the world. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll to to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men from God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. And then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands upon ten thousands, and they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and in a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and under the sea and all that is in them, singing, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So last week, if you remember, in chapter 4, we were in the war room of God seeking behind closed doors uh, what to see what the place of God's sovereign rule looks like and what a vision it was. There was God in his total sovereignty. There's nothing that happens or can happen in this world without God overruling control. Nothing is left to time and chance in God's universe. But alongside his sovereignty is his utter holiness. God is so utterly pure in his being and character that nothing evil can abide in his presence for an instant. He is utterly unlikeness in power and purity. So all we and all creation could do in response at the end of chapter 4 is to worship him. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. But now against that backdrop, one question remains. If God is so utterly and totally in charge, and so utterly and totally pure, What is he doing in his world about all its evil? And and, um, not just the evil that mean Christians have to suffer for their faith, although that was the backdrop to the seven churches, as we've seen previously, but the evil that's in, uh, in us too. How can God change fallen, failing sinners like us, who deserve his judgment and wrath, into those who can stand before his throne forever in heaven? Well, it's chapter 5 and its vision that gives us the answer. 
the answer to our greatest problem. Because it starts in verses 1 to 4 with the tragedy of our rebellion, the utter tragedy of our total inability before God. So in the vision, if you look, um, it zooms in on God's right hand. And there in verse 1, he has a scroll written on both sides, an image taken from Ezekiel chapter 2. And there in Ezekiel, it stands for God's judgment on all the evil that he sees. And the scroll has to be eaten. That is, it needs to be owned and destroyed if God is going to save his people. But now in this vision in Revelation, God makes it clear one of the most offensive parts of the Christian message. Verse 2, I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. And I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll and look inside. What is the most controversial part of the gospel? It's that none of us, not one of us, can do anything to have access to the presence of God. And why is that controversial? Well, we're all used to saying in churches that we think of ourselves as sinners, aren't we? But we say the words, but hardly think about what they mean. There is, in this vision, no ultimate benefit in any human religion or human morality when it comes to our standing before God. Of course, having a faith or living a moral life may have benefits to our society, but what John sees in the throne room of God is that none of it counts for anything before him. No wonder John wept. Think about it. There are thousands of people in the Cheadle area who don't go to church but live honest, respectable lives. Deep down, they probably feel that there is a God, that they will deserve at least some sort of a hearing little realising that the only future that that self-justifying morality will give them is an eternal separation from a holy God, facing an eternal judgment. It makes no difference, you see, if you commit adultery with one person or 50 people. Your unfaithfulness still destroys relationships. That's the point of sin. But don't just weep for those outside the church Weep for us inside too. Weep for the hundreds of people who feel deep down that their religion, their church attendance, their prayers, their attempts to follow the Bible, their commitment to God in some way earns them a right to enter God's presence. Because if that's all that we're relying on, even our godliness would still condemn us to hell. Isaiah, the prophet, once prophesied to the church that your, filthiness, your righteousness is like filthy rags. Even the best of your religion falls so far short of God's utter holiness that it's more of the character of sin than being a blessing. You see, our whole lives are not yet caught up with the wholehearted, all-absorbing worship of God in heaven and that nothing he is worthy of nothing less. Weep because we're falling so far short of God's holiness and glory. There's nothing in all of humanity worthy of God except, no, in the vision there is one. Verse 5, do not weep. 38, the voice, see, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. See, verse 5 to 10 show us the triumph of our Redeemer, our utter dependency on Jesus Christ. How can God fully punish evil and yet save sinners? He does it in his own self-sacrifice of his son. At the heart of heaven, in the war room of God, in the center of God's throne, from where the universe is ruled, John sees, verse 5, a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing alive. Salvation from the holy judgment of God has been made through the sacrifice of a lamb. It always was in the Old Testament, sacrifice. But who is he? Well, he is the Lion of Judah, verse 5. He fulfills a prophecy of Genesis 49, verse 9, that the future king would be a descendant of Judah. And he is the Root of David. He is the one from Isaiah, chapter 11, verse 1, from whom David will derive his kingship. In other words, this, this lamb, this lamb must be God himself. And the vision underlines it. He has seven horns, so 
the symbol of perfect strength, and seven eyes, the symbol of perfect wisdom, and the fact that he's the source of the sevenfold Holy Spirit, the sevenfold spirits of God, the Holy Spirit going into the world. So human destiny, the way through the judgment for God's people is by a man with the power of God, the wisdom of God, who gives the spirit of God, who makes a sacrifice of himself to enable us to have access to the presence of God. That's the new covenant that God makes. And that brings forth a song, which incidentally every new covenant in the Bible brings new songs. But the, the elders and the creatures sing this. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. What makes Jesus worthy to be the centre of human destiny, to bring his people through the judgment to God's presence? It's not just that the fact that he's God. God can't just let us off our rebellion and evil. Jesus is worthy because he saves us through the paying the penal penalty of our judgment himself in, his, in our place by shedding his blood. He does it so we don't have to do it. And that is God's strength revealed in the weakness of a crucified messiah just think about the encouragement that is to a struggling suffering persecuted church to the watching world jesus death was the ultimate humiliation a tragic end to a, a promising life but in the reality of the throne room of god his death was purchasing people for god from every community across the world the cross of Jesus Christ is the message that both saves and transforms God's people to be acceptable servants of him. It's literally his death that gives us access to that throne room. And more than that, in the vision, it is the crucified lamb himself who now is the embodied center of our worship in heaven. He is the main focus of our praise symbolized by the harps that are played, and the main focus of our prayers, symbolized by bowls of incense. And that truth about Jesus, the Lamb who is victorious, teaches us the truth about our faith. In verses 11 to 14, our life in the light of this vision has to be lived for the glory of God. See, John's vision, in a sense, you can follow it like a cinema screen. He pans back from the lamb, slain lamb at the centre of God's throne. And his vision now encompasses the whole of the angelic creation. Thousands upon thousands, ten thousands upon ten thousands, all singing to the lamb. The same praise, incidentally, they sang to the father in verses, chapter 4, verse 11. This is our God, the lamb who was slain for us. And then, panning back even more, out of the heavens themselves, John sees the whole of the earthly creation uniting in the same praise. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honour and glory and power forever and ever. Again, what's going on here is that John is showing us in the vision the very heart of what faith is about. Faith isn't the practice of our religion. It isn't the morality of our behaviour. It is the worship of Jesus Christ, the conscious desire to give him the glory for everything and in everything. As it says in verse 12, he is worthy to receive, that is in true worship, to put everything at his disposal. He's worthy to receive the power. So we give him the credit for any influence we have. He's worthy to receive the wisdom. That is, we give him the authority in understanding what is true about our world. He's worthy of the strength, i.e. the credit for what we've been able to do. The honour, that is the praise for any status that we have. The glory, that is credit for any legacy we leave. And the praise, credit for any thanks that we get. In fact, the whole of our life, in other words. That's faith. Not, let, not letting God get involved in a bit of our life, but letting God take the control and the focus of our life. The Puritans had a, a nice phrase that summed it all up. You'll have heard it before. All life is worship. 
the way we work and rest and play, as well as the way we sing and the way we pray, all of it reflects the extent to which we are living, honouring our God, honouring Jesus Christ. And that's why this vision's given for us. In the business of busyness and the business of living our lives, we tend to forget why. Why are we doing it all? We're not here to squeeze a few pleasant moments or monetary achievements out of our earthly lives. We're here to live out on earth the reality of heaven. In everything we do, in everything we say, in everything we think, in everything we pray, we are to do it for the honour and glory of the one who laid his life down for us, who gave his life for us. See, this vision isn't just a picture of what heaven will be like. It is the vision of what heaven is like now. The reality behind the universe, the truth that means whatever life throws at us, we can be confident that nothing will separate us from the love of the Lamb who was slain for us. That truth means our lives to be lived for him and his glory alone. And on that vision is built not just our life now, but all of our hopes for the future, because that too is in his hand. Which is exactly what John is about to go on to explain as he takes us through the mysteries of the future of the triumph of the king, the triumph of the lamb that was slain. Well, we're going to look at that next week as we begin part of the great apocalyptic vision of our future in chapter 6 and beyond. But in the meantime, let that vision fill you with joy and awe as we come to the one who is the king and as we celebrate glory in his presence. Amen. Let me um, pray and then I'll leave you with some music to reflect on those truths as we share them together. And including our prayers as we're on day five with Thy Kingdom Come, a prayer for that purpose for which we're here, to be our witness and to share the truth of Jesus. So let's pray. God our Father, what a glorious vision. Thank you for the uh, inspiring uh, and giving us a true picture of all that you were about. In the throne room of God we see our Saviour, with those eternal marks of his sacrifice for us, in the glory of his perfection and victory, and the assurance that we stand forgiven and renewed because of what he has done. Lord, help us stand in awe and not take for granted the depth of this great gift. Help us know the joy of our salvation and shape us to live for the glory of his name. And we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. And Father, as we reflect on the glory of our Saviour, so we reflect too on the, um, uh, the awesome calling that you have given us here on earth. We pray for our friends and our neighbours, those who are struggling because they don't know the truth of the world. They don't see Jesus, their only hope, their only life. Lord, deepen in us that sense of urgency that we have, the jeopardy that their lives are in. Give us a deeper compassion for the people in need. Help us to make the most of every opportunity. And even in this time of thy kingdom come, as we're praying uh, for friends to come to find Jesus for themselves, may they find him to be the lamb slain for their, uh, them and the king of, their, king of kings and lord of lords. And so the prayer for thy kingdom come, says this, Loving God, thank you for coming to find us with your love. Please reveal your love and your peace to my friends. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And Heavenly Father, thinking of that vision, we pray to for all those who are struggling with the pressures of the life at the moment, Pressures of work, grief, fear about their monetary circumstances and their family safety. Thank you that this vision speaks to them all. So open our eyes to see the truth that Jesus is seated on the throne ruling for us. That he is the lamb who is slain bringing forgiveness to us. and That he has sent his spirit to be our comforter and to always be with us. 
So, Lord, as we come to you again, open our eyes to those truths, fill our lives with your presence, and use our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. More from this great book of Revelation next time. In the meantime, maybe you'd like to use this song to reflect on those truths and bring your own prayers to God. Thank you. Awake my soul and sing of him